Part of being an out atheist, whether you like it or not, is fielding a steady stream of uninformed and often extraordinarily condescending questions from coworkers, family members, and friends who just don't get how you can not love Jesus. Now, some of us choose to avoid these discussions, and, and that's fine, but many of us welcome a genuine or even semi-genuine opportunity to explain and defend our worldview. But as we quickly learn, while these discussions can be very rewarding, they're much more likely to just be frustrating. So to help us maximize the former and minimize the latter, I've invited a friend on the show tonight that has about as much experience fielding religious questions from believers as anyone alive on the planet. Tracy Harris is one of the many fine co-hosts of the Atheist Experience television show, and you may also know her as an increasingly sought-after atheist speaker. Tracy, so happy you could join us tonight. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Oh, you bet. Now, so for those listeners who aren't familiar with your show, tell us in a nutshell, what is the Atheist Experience? The Atheist Experience is a public outreach vehicle of the atheist community of Austin. Um, they don't have operators at the association, and so once a week, generally, on Sunday afternoons, they have the phones available and atheists available on the end of those phones where anyone can call in, uh, any member of the public, while we're live on the air for one hour, and ask us questions about uh, atheism, basically experience talking to an atheist and ask us, you know, about how we navigate the world. Excellent. Okay, so now how long has that been going? Oh my gosh, it's been going a very long time. I know it just did like 10 years a little while ago, so I know oh, it's wow. been going more than 10 years. Yeah, much longer than I've been on it. Well, no, so how did you get involved? Um, it's kind of a little bit of a long story, but I was invited several times to like, be on it, and uh, I was kind of shy to try it out, but Don Baker convinced me, and, and then they put me on the schedule and told me I was in the rotation. Awesome. So uh, all of your listeners that are big fans of yours like me have Don to thank. That's, that's good to know. So okay. you, you say it's public outreach. So what is, what is it that you're hoping to accomplish with this public outreach? Well, you have to bear in mind that the show was started a very long time ago in Austin, Texas, by a small group of atheists, and they were mainly trying to allow people to have an interaction with an atheist, because not many people understood atheism or knew anybody who was out as an atheist, so it was a rare thing. There were a lot of misconceptions, and so it was just the group felt that it was an opportunity to educate the public on uh, about atheism because a lot was not known. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the, the internet wasn't quite the... Uh, right. It wasn't there. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so now I'm dying to know, and I'm sure a lot of your fans are, are you the kind of person that finds yourself in these type of discussions in your day-to-day -day life, or is, is that just something that you reserve for the show? I really do reserve it for the show. I don't mind talking about it in my day-to-day -day life, but... I find that it's more productive the more people who are exposed to the dialogue. Public dialogue, I think, is much more fruitful than a private personal dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I am fascinated when I meet someone who has religious beliefs that will talk about them. I love to ask questions and just see you know, how they navigate things. Sometimes people get offended when I feel like I'm just curious. Uh, and I don't mean to be offensive, but they, I guess they just don't like the questioning. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I've had other people who have come to our dinners who were, for example, ju had just left their religion. So, for example, we had a uh, young man who came to one of our dinners who was ex-Scientology, who was raised as a Scientologist. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that was quite an opportunity. And so I started asking him tons of questions, and there were a few times I saw him sort of almost look embarrassed and I felt bad because I, I wasn't trying to embarrass him. I just, it, it was just such an opportunity to talk to him and ask him about the religion. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think in my sort of innocent quest to get all my questions answered, I may have, you know, not necessarily thought about how some of these questions might make him feel. Right. And some, sometimes I don't, I don't think ahead like that. And I just start asking because it's just interesting. Well, I think that's something – it's very hard for an atheist, especially if you've been an atheist for a long time or you were never a theist, to understand what it is to hold something sacred. Um, and it is – these discussions really are minefields of, of potential offense. I, I find myself constantly offending people without even understanding what exactly they're offended by. Yeah. So – now – Obviously, there are a number of different forms of religious debates that you're going to find yourself in, and the forum that you're in is going to inform the tactics that you'll employ. So if you're you know, taking calls on a, a public access show, you're probably going to do things a little differently than if your coworker comes up to you genuinely curious about your beliefs. So 
for the purposes of this discussion tonight, I want to talk about the in-person, one-on-one discussions. Maybe there's a few people listening, maybe there isn't. But let's say the kind of discussions that many of us found ourselves in uh, at a cookout on Monday. You know, Cousin Bill saunters over, and you can <laughs> just tell by the look on his face that he's finally got enough beer in him to play Stump the Atheist. He wipes most of the mustard off his lip, and he says, So you're the one that doesn't believe in God, huh? You're that atheist. So... Before we get into some of Bill's like go-to arguments, tell us, in your experience, what should we be looking to do first in this discussion? Uh, well, you said this guy's name is Bill, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, Bill seems a little confrontational. Uh, he doesn't seem like he's coming at this necessarily from a, a desire for a real honest conversation. Mm-hmm. So you might be having to deal with uh, with a defensive personality in addition to trying to have a conversation, which can complicate things a little bit. Right. Uh, I've had some very interesting conversations with people who aren't defensive uh, and who I always started the conversation by telling them, okay, you've come to me, you, you, you're you asking questions and you believe in God. And I just want to warn you that sometimes the answers to the questions can offend people. Mm-hmm. And it's not my, you know, it's not my uh, goal to be offensive to you or to insult your beliefs or anything like that. Um, but if I if it starts to go down a path where you're not comfortable with the answers or you think it's causing a problem, I'm more than happy to stop having the conversation. So I you know I try to start the conversation openly. And so when Bill comes up and he's had a few beers and he's a little bit confrontational, um, the, I would probably try to you know set Bill at ease a little bit um, and maybe tell him that I don't mind talking about it, but. It's, uh, you know, this is this I'm ha- I'm open to discussing my worldview and uh, answering whatever questions that he has. And as long as it can be a respectful discussion, we can continue the conversation. I definitely like that, uh, that idea of sort of giving him an exit strategy up front, uh, sort of telling him, yeah, no, if you want to if, if you're offended at any time, we can just back away from that. I think that's definitely a good idea. OK, so so what about somebody who's a little less confrontational than Bill, Some, somebody who. You know, is genuinely curious. Maybe they're still going to try to trap you or save your soul or whatever within the discussion, but they're just genuinely curious and not confrontational. Is there anything that you would be you know, looking to establish before the discussion really got going there? Well, actually, that intro is what I use when some, even when somebody's not confrontational, because I think sometimes people don't, if, especially if they've never had a conversation with an atheist or someone who doesn't believe, they may not be aware of how they'll feel when you start to talk about rejecting the things that they think are, you know, clearly visible or um, not questioned or, you know, and when you start to question these things or you explain why you question them or why you find them unreasonable, I mean, you're basically telling them whether there's no way to dance around it too much. You're, you're basically saying, I find what you believe to be unreasonable. Mm-hmm. And they may not have thought it through that far when they start asking you to tell them about you know, why you don't believe in God or I mean, it's going to come down to the a belief that you have subscribed to and devoted yourself to. I find unreasonable. And here's why. And so I like to warn people up front, you know, that this could be an uncomfortable conversation, even if they seem open when they get into it, they might start to realize like, oh, wow, this is making me feel uncomfortable. Um, excellent point. All right, so now obviously nobody's really obligated to take all comers. So are, are there any red flags for you that say like, okay, this person is just not going to be worth engaging? Oh, yeah. When you have to – when you're going through these cycles where you're explaining something and you have to explain it ad nauseum until the person gets it, and then five minutes later they're right back to where they started. <laughs> I've been there. And you're saying, okay, yeah, we've we've done this already and we worked through this and we agreed on this. Do you not remember that we had this conversation? And there are times when you realize that the person really isn't listening to you, that they're not conceding any points, that they're just jumping from point to point. They won't stop and concede anything. They will not resolve a point. They just want to move right along to their next item, Mm -hmm. which generally indicates that this is a person that's preaching to you. I mean, they're just trying to convert you. They aren't really listening. They're not really having a conversation. Your side of the dialogue is non-existent to them. And in this case, you're just wasting your time. And I think it's very fair to to tell someone, I don't really see how this conversation is productive because I don't feel that, I feel like I'm listening and responding to your points, but 
you don't seem to be conceding any of my points. You don't seem to be letting me uh, work with you to resolve any of these things before you're jumping to the next point. I mean, I, I'm not feeling like you're listening to me. I don't feel as though I'm heard. And I feel like this is a, a monologue that you're having you right. know, with me and not a dialogue. And if we can adjust that, and if, if you can show me that you're able to listen and to understand what I'm saying, then I don't have a problem proceeding with this conversation. But if it's going to just be a monologue where you are ignoring what I'm saying, not remembering what I'm saying, not paying attention to what I'm saying, and you're just simply plowing ahead with what you want to say, I am not going to continue to engage in this. And we have uh, been contacted by people who say that they have, for example, in-laws who hammer them about God every time they are in their house. Like I go to visit my in-laws and they always bring up religion and then it gets into these conversations that are not productive. Sometimes they get angry. I don't want to go over there. I don't want to talk to them about this. You know, it's like we get along in every other area. It's just religious stuff causes problems all the time. And what I generally tell them is. If this is the case, and if, if this is just a you know broken record that happens every time you go over there, it's really okay to say, you know, we've had some difficult conversations about this topic, and I prefer not to engage in this conversation with you. And I would rather that we talk about things that are pleasant, and we have a pleasant visit, because, you know, we're not going to live forever, and I would like to... Uh, engage with you as family and have a nice visit. And I think that this impedes our ability to have a nice visit. And so I'm not going to engage in a religious discussion with you. Right. I, I know I personally feel like I, I, I almost have this, this visceral reaction when I feel like I have to back down from that discussion, even if I know it can't be productive. But that's definitely the way to go in a lot of these situations. Well, and what I tell them is that their in-laws, or you know, in this case, it's the in-laws, but it could be anyone, um, that their in-laws are gonna, they're going to buck against that. They're going to continue to try to have this conversation. So the person that is not wanting to have the conversation has to have a resolve. And instead of breaking down and, and engaging, they need to just continue to say, yeah, I understand you want to talk about this, but, and then you just rinse and repeat. But we've had this conversation before. It is not productive. It ends up being sometimes uncomfortable, and I would rather have a good visit, so I'm not going to engage in this. And you may have to repeat yourself over and over and over because they are not going to want to accept that boundary. Yeah, no, I have a lot of family members where my rule is, you know, I will have this discussion with you in writing. Uh, when we're in person, we don't have th those kind of discussions. So. Yeah, you can set whatever boundaries work, um, but sometimes you have to continually remind a person that is a boundary. Mm -hmm. and, and it means having the resolve to not slide back into the conversation, but to keep saying, no, I'm sorry, this is a hard line. I'm not crossing this. I'm not having this discussion with you. Can we please talk about something pleasant? It's so hard to do when you know you're right and they're wrong. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> again, definitely good advice. Yeah, when you've had the conversation enough times, though, you know where it's going and, mm -hmm. and whether or not it can be productive with this particular person or group of people. And if it can't be, there is no point to just simply having the Groundhog Day of conversations <laughs> that just never ends and is the same every time. That's the perfect way to describe it. Okay, so let's let's dig into their arsenal a bit, if you don't mind. Now, obviously, I don't have any stumpers in this list here, but <laughs> these are all questions that everyone listening to the show has heard a hundred times. They have their preferred answers, their go-to analogies. So I'm interested, you know, not only in how you prefer to tackle these questions, but also why you prefer that particular argument or that particular analogy, what you've done in the past that hasn't been as effective, and possibly what invalid answers you hear other atheists giving to these same questions. Uh, so I, I guess we should start by giving Pascal his day in court. So how, how do you handle the uh, what if you're wrong question? You know, there are many angles to address Pascal, and I honestly don't think that any of them are that bad. Uh, any of them can be fair responses. You know, I think the main one that I hear often is um, there are so many gods. What if you're wrong? Have you investigated them all? I think that the the number one problem with that response is not that it's an invalid response, but that many religious people, when they hear it, just have other reasons for thinking that they're so sure that their religion is the right one, mm -hmm. that the idea that they could be wrong doesn't really sink into them. So even though it is a fair question to say, you know, have you looked at these other gods? They're just like, no, I found this one. It's like, you know, God speaks to me, so I know it's right. And, you know, and so I've got the right religion. There's no need to keep looking. So they're already so sure about the rightness of their particular God and that all other gods are wrong. 
um, that sometimes trying to get them to understand the problem as far as which God, they, it doesn't really sink into them. And it's not a problem with the response, it's a problem with the, the recipient of the response. Uh, and so that's kind of the, one of the, the problems that you might run into if you utilize that one. The, uh, some of the others are that we don't control what we believe, you know, on the level of just simply arbitrarily being able to adjust our beliefs at the snap of a finger. So I can't make myself believe that if I jump off the top of a skyscraper, I'm not going to fall to the ground. Right. I don't control my beliefs on that level. Beliefs are something that we come to as a result of, um, you know, being exposed to things that have convinced us that something is true. And if we are not convinced that it's true, then I don't understand what, what help it is to ask me, what if I'm wrong? Right. I mean, that doesn't help to convert me. Right. Um, if I'm wrong, then I, you know, according to you, potentially, depending on what your beliefs are, I'm going to hell. And there's nothing I can do about that because the thought that I'm going to go to hell if I'm wrong does not persuade me that it's true. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense. There's, there's, it's, it's just there's less for them to get a hold of there because obviously they have to admit that their beliefs aren't be based on you know some divine wager that they're making. They're obviously based on more than that. They're certainly not going to want to pretend that they're based on uh, less than that. So I can definitely see why that'd be a little bit more of a, an effective way to shut down that argument. Yeah, another thing that I sometimes point out is um, that the argument, because it is very often a first line when you encounter somebody that's um, Christian theist, that's almost, it's very often the first thing they ask. And I find it interesting that they lead with fear, right? I mean, this is what they're leading with, the fear. That's their best foot forward. Instead of, you know, and when you tell them, that this particular apologetic is rooted in fear, that it tells me more about the fear of the person offering the argument than it does about me. Uh, the reality is if you don't fear being wrong, what will happen to you if you don't believe, then you wouldn't expect me to fear it. So you must be living in fear. That's an excellent point. Yeah, fear keeps you beholden here. Fear has got you so gripped that you actually sell your religion with fear first, like trying to frighten me into it. And, and again, you can't frighten me into a, a belief. Yeah, no, I think, I think yeah, they're, they're probably telling you a lot more about uh, their belief system than they realize they are with that one. That's never occurred to me. All right, so moving right along here, sticking, uh, moving on to sort of the burden of proof motif. What do you say when when Theus asks you, you know, how how can you be sure, or how can you prove that there is no God? Um, how do I prove there is no God? I I would just simply say that for me, I mean, a lot of uh, atheists, of course, will point out that they're not asserting that there is no God, that they're not asserting strong atheism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but for me, I actually would probably go the route of asserting that com comparable to how they might feel co very comfortable with the idea of someone saying there are no leprechauns, that I don't have, I, I feel similarly about the concept of God. And that to me, the, the concept of, of a God is just as unlikely as something like a leprechaun probably is to them, and that if they feel comfortable asserting there are no leprechauns, I feel comfortable asserting there is no God, probably for many of the same reasons. And so it's it, it kind of it's a rough one because it can offend people. Right. But the problem is, you know, some people will say, well, use another God like Thor or use, and you know, it's to me, I have to use something that is like a clearly fantastical thing that is something that is going to really portray to them this is the extent to which i don't believe and i will sometimes tell them that that i'm not using this example in a you know to demean or belittle what it is that you believe or your concept of a god but i need you to understand that it is this is the level of unlikely to me that you're going to have to deal with if you want to have this conversation. You have to understand my perspective, and this is my perspective regardless of how that impacts you know, how you feel about your own beliefs. I realize you believe in this thing, but to me, if, you, if we're going to have a conversation and you really want to understand my position on it, you're going to have to understand that. 
I definitely like that more than a, a long discussion of, of burden of proof there and, and uh, the difference between agnostic atheism, et cetera. Well, I think the whole idea of burden of proof when they're saying, you know, how do, you, can't, you can't be sure there is no God, to me is, uh, it, I consider it a, a, a form of special pleading because the same people who are asserting that I should not discount God because I cannot disprove God will probably, will in all likelihood, be willing to reject fairies, leprechauns, gremlins, like all manner of fantastical creatures because, and, and be unable to disprove them. So they really don't hold that you should hold out that something is possible unless you can disprove it. They do not hold to that as a, as a principle. But when it comes to their God, they seem to want to demand that I hold to that as a principle. And so like, and I like to point out that it's, it's hypocritical, first of all, because you reject things you can't disprove and you feel very comfortable with that. But when I reject it, you tell me I can't do that because I can't disprove it. And so what we seem to have here is some special pleading uh, because it seems as though you're quite willing to do this with all manner of things except your God, which you're going to have to explain to me why, why God cannot be discounted in the same way. Right. All right, well, I'll tell you what, I've got a ton more on my list, and we're obviously not going to be able to get to all of them. So I guess we're going to have to at least get to my least favorite, what I consider the most insulting, but probably the one I hear most often as a theistic challenge. If, if you don't believe in God, where do you get your morals? Oh, yeah, this will probably just take about 30 seconds to right. answer. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah, that's a long one. But let me see if I can wrap it really quickly. Mm -hmm. For me, this is, and this is for not, uh, certainly not, Everybody agrees with my positions on morality, as you saw firsthand. Yes, I did. But I tend to look at morality as, if, just like anything else, if it's not demonstrable, I then I'm not sold on it. So to me, the demonstration of morality comes in the form of uh, behavioral psychology, where they test especially on non-human social species in order to uh, find whether these uh, other species have morality or not if they exhibit what's called moral tendencies. Mm -hmm. And these have been defined as things like empathy, equ equity, compassion, fairness. Uh, if an animal exhibits these things, they are said to be exhibiting moral tendencies. If they don't exhibit those things, then they, you know, they're going to have less and less uh, moral tendencies and sometimes none. If they're an asocial species, they're not going to need a, a moral system because morality is uh, useful only in species that interact. And the, the higher the level of interaction and cooperation, the more you need to be able to exhibit some sort of respect for the other. Uh, and you also have to have an acknowledgement of the other that separates and differentiates them from other species. So, for example, if a pack of wolves could not define itself as wolves, right, and if they confused themselves, for example, with deer, they would have a problem. Right. So it's important that wolves recognize other wolves in a special sense and that they understand that they can communicate and co cooperate in a way that other species will not offer them um, for the benefit of their survival. They have evolved to be this way. And it means that they have to be able to view this thing as like me. The deer is not like me. This other wolf is like me. The other wolf, I can communicate with it. I, it. We can work together. We can cooperate together. And when they test on social species like dogs and chimpanzees and some other primates and sometimes even rats um, and many other species, in fact, they find evidence of these metrics, the compassion the equity, empathy, fairness. Mm -hmm. Different levels of it, too, which is kind of an interesting thing. Dogs have a different sense of fairness than chimpanzees, um, which have a sense of fairness more like ours. But they still, the dogs still have a sense of fairness. It's just different. So every one of these species has their own sort of morality that operates within the group. So for me, this is what we mean when we say morality. And then when you pull away from that, I feel like a truly moral system has to be somehow based on this understanding of the individuals within my species are equal to me or in some way the same as opposed to other species which are different. And so there is this value system going on where I value the members of my species as more equal to me than valuing other species which I would not see as equal to me. They would be different than me, right? I, I cannot treat them like human beings. It wouldn't work. 
Right. And so we developed this intra-species sort of cooperation that relies on the ability to empathize and understand fairness and understand, you know, that when and have that theory of mind that you may think you probably think like me, you seem to communicate like me, we cooperate in similar ways. Uh, and this keeps our society going just like it keeps a pack of wolves going. And, and if you have another system that is based on something else, to me, that's an ethic. That would be like an ethical system, not necessarily a moral system. When when you have something like there is a, a fox, a the silver fox experiment. People can Google that. But there was a species of fox, an asocial, a fairly asocial fox. They come together for fighting over territory and breeding, but they don't hang out. They don't uh, hunt together. They don't, you know, do things together as a group. Mm -hmm. So it's an aso a highly asocial animal, and they were bred for fur, in the fur trade. They wanted to make a more passive type of this fox because they're very hard to handle. Being an asocial species, they're kind of a ferocious little fox. And when they started breeding for passivity, what they did is they would take the pups that were more passive and easier to handle, and they would breed those trying to make another, like a variant of this fox that would be easier to work with in the fur trade. But what they ended up doing was that in not too many generations, like in one man's lifetime, they ended up producing an animal that had a completely different look to it. It had like a curly tail and different colored coats. And it had, um, it, it almost had big floppy ears. It, it made little barking sounds where the other animal didn't make calls or barks. Because why would it need to? It's not social. It doesn't need to communicate on that level. But these things did weird things like tail wag and, you know, I mean, all these communicative things so they were but they what they ended up doing without meaning to was producing a more social version of this animal hmm. and to me what this demonstrates is that morality is actually something that can be bred i can take an animal that doesn't require a moral me, moral metrics and i can breed it to produce a, a variant of it that is social and moral and starts to incorporate more communication and moral metrics. Without reading the Bible at all, yeah, somehow. And I mean, but that's an interesting thing to say that you can actually see how morality is genetically derived. Right, well, that's what's always struck me as, as why this question is so bizarre is that it, it doesn't seem odd to me or implausible to me at all that morality has evolutionary benefits you know so it seems like the naturalistic uh, explanation for the world already explains that without any further discussion now obviously it's a huge can of worms and the more you it's like time the more you talk about it the more you realize you don't understand it so uh like a lot of these topics that could easily have turned into an interview all by itself we're <laughs> not gonna have time to cover all of this but uh hopefully uh we can talk you into coming back on sometime and uh, offering us a few more pointers Okay, yeah, no, there's no problem at all. Excellent. Now, if you want to hear more of Tracy's intellectual badassery, check out The Atheist Experience, which you're going to find linked on the show notes for this episode. I should mention that the last episode they did was one of my favorites of all time, so you may never find a better time to start being a fan of that show. Tracy, thanks again. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great.